Good morning. Um, Hi. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, we only have a half an hour, so we got to move fairly quickly. Ten years ago, you were here as a pure television executive. Um, your life has changed quite a bit since then, um, as and especially as television and content and advertising uh, all collide. Dis discuss that journey. First, thank you very much for having me. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure being here with you. It's, that's why it has been 10 years. And my life has changed, mostly with my daughters and with my, my job. That has most been, it has been months a, a game changer than the, than the job. But uh, <laughs> uh, in 10 years, the world of content, uh, TV uh, slash uh, advertising, uh, has been uh, completely disrupted. Uh, I think there has been a, a double big disruption. Firstly, there has been a disruption of all the distribution platforms. Uh, ten years ago, uh, uh, the digital terrestrial TV has increased dramatically the, the number of traditional TV distribution platforms. Uh, the uh, video sharing platform on the digital, YouTube, uh, Dailymotion, uh, has been uh, uh, through a tremendous success over this last decade. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, the over-the-top uh, channels are uh, completely changing the way uh, we are watching uh, uh, content. In the same time, uh, the way we produce content uh, is changing. Uh, we all have uh, smartphones, uh, uh, digital cameras, so it's very easy to produce content. And sometimes, uh, content from a good quality uh, I've been reading uh, uh, a statistic uh, saying that every minute, uh, 100 hours of content is uploaded on the internet. So today, I mean, the world we used to know, uh, where we knew more or less all the content, no longer exists. We had uh, a very nice dinner yesterday with friends from, uh, from Canal Plus, and we were discussing uh, the new series, uh, the new drama, the new movies, and uh, we just realized that it was impossible to see everything. Ten years ago, it was possible to see everything. We were living in an, uh, let's say, exhaustive world, and now we have uh, shifted to a world of infinity. It's impossible today to have this type of erudition. We have got the content. We need to be able to, to see how we can uh, uh, navigate in this uh, ocean of content. So. I don't want to say I, I don't recognize the industry today uh, uh, as I knew it, but uh, the, the, the number of, of content has become infinite and is changing completely the way we will, uh, uh, TV channels need to address uh, their viewers or uh, the way we can uh, monetize the content. And uh, it's, it's clearly uh, uh, a fascinating uh, disruption. Speaking of disruption, how are you positioning Havas in that highly disrupted intersection of technology and content? I think uh, uh, Havas has a role to play, or communication group has a role to play, because the two challenges, uh, of, one of the two of the challenges uh, the content industry has to address is, I would say, the first one to put, uh, uh, how to put the consumer at the heart, at the core. And uh, the second one is about monetization. If, if I just focus on the, on the consumer at the heart, I think technology has a role to play. We are living in a world today where uh, data is uh, offering a lot of new opportunities to shift from this, uh, I don't like this expression, but from this bulk content environment to a, a meaningful content environment. Uh, in, the, in the advertising uh, landscape, we have uh, we have learned, thanks to mathematicians who are producing algorithm, to address the right message at the right person at the right time. Imagine that we can address the right type of content at the right person on the right device at the right time of the day. It will become much more meaningful. If you allow me maybe just to, to give you a, an anecdote that is a true story that has happened to me two years ago, I think you will understand the, what are the, the how you can apply this technology to, to content. I was uh, going to San Francisco. I was talking over uh, Havas. It was uh, a little bit more than 18 months ago. And I was going to, to, to San Francisco in the Valley to meet the, 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 
these fascinating uh, companies. And when I landed from Paris in San Francisco, it was, uh, I would say, 5 p.m. And uh, as soon as I uh, went out of the airport, I received a, a text message on my cell phone saying, uh, Hi, Yannick. Uh, welcome to San Francisco. Uh, uh, if you want, we have a 30% discount on uh, salmon sushi in a nice Japanese restaurant near your hotel. And I said, wow. <laughs> is it a joke? I mean, how do they know that I'm in San Francisco? How do they know that uh, uh, in which hotel do I sleep? And uh, how do they know that I like sushi, and especially uh, salmon sushi? And uh, it really kept me up at night. Uh, I was really intrigued. I mean, what's going on here? I know it's the valet, it's different, but what's going on there? And um, I remember I was uh, the next day with the Google guys, and I told them about my story. And they said, yes, yes, I know, it's us. <laughs> say, OK, what do you mean it's you? I say, yeah, yeah, we are doing this type of advertising. I say, how does that work? I say, with Waze, we know where you are, because you have accepted to be geolocalized even when you don't open the application. Then we have access to your G calendar, so we know in which hotel uh, you are. I say, OK. And what about Salmon Sushi? How do you know that I like Salmon Sushi? It's, he said, this is different. Uh, do we have a Gmail account? I say, yeah, but it's for my personal activity. It's not uh, professional. I say, yeah, but. Maybe you communicate with your wife through Gmail. Say so, yes. And uh, I remember one day, my wife sent me uh, uh, an email saying, what do you want to have for dinner? I said, uh, maybe uh, sushi. <laughs> say, uh, what type of sushi? I mean, su salmon sushi. And they have an algorithm that have uh, thousands of variables that monitor uh, the text. And they have uh, managed to understand uh, that I was a sushi salmon lover. And so I have this very precise uh, type of uh, advertising. So, Honestly, I was a little bit frightened, but I'm not here to, to judge anyone. But you can see that with the right data and the, with the right scientist, what you can do and the ability to change dramatically the way uh, you distribute the content. In a, in a world where, where that example can exist, how, how are your clients catching up? How do, your clients, uh, how do you relate to your clients? Um, and how do you get them on board to sort of experiment with this world, which for some might be a little intimidating? It's, yeah, it's much more than intimidating. I would say that our clients are uh, uh, very curious. They want to be the first to test new opportunities. And they can see that with the fragmentation of audience, with multitasking, it's getting more and more complex. It's getting more and more complicated to, to catch people's attention. I mean, the classic TVCs, the classic 30-second spots uh, between the, the, the TV programs is no longer sufficient. I, I think it's still important, but it's no longer sufficient. So brands are trying to, to invest in new territories of expression. They want to be more, um, they want to invest more in, in what we call brand content to see how can they address their consumers in a, in a different way. Uh, I have brought with me a, a, a video clip about uh, what we did for Coke, uh, where they asked us, what can we do or what can you do for us that is different from a TVC? Uh, we want to, to to, to see how we can address the youngest and, and, and give some new messages. So maybe if Wait, it's... Let's play the clip and then maybe we can talk yeah. about, to it after. Let's do that. In 2014, we were facing two challenges. According to the World Health Organization, 80% of teens are not active enough. And Coca-Cola is losing its connection with teens. We decided to do something to help get teenagers moving and spread some happiness because we know that when we move, we're happier. So we partnered with Ubisoft, creator of the world's largest and most iconic music and dance game, Just Dance, which has a community of 90 million people globally and has massive reach with teens. 30% of teens in France and the UK play it. Together, we launched Ubisoft's hotly anticipated innovation, Just Dance Now, the mobile version of the game that can be played anywhere at any time, just with a smartphone. Just Dance Now includes exclusive free Coca-Cola songs, plus a challenge for teens to unlock free songs the more they moved. We created a stunt in Paris, planting a mysterious red box in the center of the city. A crowd gathered as the box opened, revealing the twins, international hip-hop dancers. They invited the audience to dance with them to the Coke song, Bind Your Move, and to download the Just Dance Now mobile game. The stunt was filmed in a teaser video released, which got 1.3 million views in only a few days, creating anticipation for the release of the full version of the film. A media and influencer strategy drove conversations and views. 
generating significant media coverage across Europe, ensuring the film spread quickly on social media, amassing millions of views on YouTube. At the same time, 35 million cans featuring a QR code to download Just Dance Now hit shelves across Europe. The campaign obtained incredible results, with 11.4 million views in only two months. 90% of viewers liked the video on YouTube, and it achieved 65% brand recognition. The film won several awards. YouTube says it was a new best practice for seeding and launching a new film. And it's in the top three most watched online films in Coke's history. And most importantly, it got teens moving. The mobile game has been downloaded 10.7 million times, and the Coke song, Find Your Move, has been played 4 million times. So that's 26 million minutes of dance, burning off 144 million calories. Thanks to Coca-Cola and Ubisoft, teens are dancing anytime, anywhere, on any device. So give us a bit of context uh, about this, uh, this activation. Um, how, was it hard to get Coke on, on board and really sort of embrace the, the, the sort of multi-screen nature of this activation? No, I think that uh, Coke, uh, maybe, most, uh, maybe more than anyone, uh, understands that they need to engage their consumers. And uh, with this type of uh, activation, it's a completely different way to, to express itself as a brand. It's a completely different way to, to address their consumers and prospects. And it's clearly helping to, to switch and to shift very rapidly the image of Coke. And uh, the engagement, you have seen the, the numbers are, are huge. And uh, um, when you see in terms of uh, uh, virality, the number of impressions, people have been sharing this uh, video just coming from France, which is not the the biggest of country of the country when you talk about numbers, so it's uh, clearly the, the I would say the the meeting between a brand who wants to be to express itself differently, wants to to invest in new territories, and uh, a forward-thinking uh, communication group. So when you when you uh, start out on the journey to create a, a piece of content like this, do you spend does your, do you and your organization spend more time thinking about data or mobile? It's a good question. I mean, uh, data is, uh, of course, key to our world. But the question we often heard about the big data has never been so, made, so many data. Uh, the human uh, beings have produced more data in the, last, in the last years and since the beginning of the human histories. But in fact, the question is how do you shift from this big data to, to a smart data? How this smart data could give meaningful insights to the, to the brand and the company. So our key question about data is how do we, uh, how do we transform this bulk into uh, uh, insights? And mobile, I would say, uh, uh, I mean, if you try to oppose mobile and desktop, it's no longer true. We now natively don't think about desktop. I mean, we are creating websites, apps for mobile, and then we adapt it to desktop. And it's no longer the, the other way around. It's clearly, uh, uh, today, a mobile-first environment. Okay. Um, I don't know if you heard about it, but there was a big merger last year. Um, uh, joking, obviously. Yeah. Um, the, how are you positioning Havas? It's a different animal than the sort of larger publicly held agencies. What's, yeah. It's a very different world now after the merger. What's, how are you positioning the group and how, how are you moving forward? So f finally, the merger didn't happen. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> no. Uh, no uh, I mean, it was at the same time as I was taking, uh, I was being put at the helm of Havas that this merger was announced. So the, for those who don't know, the number two and the number three of our industry were merging to create the number one uh, advertising group in the world. And I was doing Roadshow. It was uh, August, uh, late August uh, 2013. And I remember precisely in London, I was meeting uh, smart investors. And they were telling me, you know, uh, you at Havas, uh, after this merger, you have two options. I said, OK. So tell me my option. They say, uh, option number one, you die. And option number two, you get consolidated. So I mean. Uh, is there an option number three? Say no, because <laughs> scale matters. So if, I don't believe anymore. But you're, smart, you're nice, and I like you, but 
you have no future like this. So okay, I went back to, to, to Paris and to New York or to headquarters and I said, okay guys, uh, these are our two options, so maybe uh, let's start working. And the chance we have is that we are living uh, uh, in a completely uh, disrupting industry. I mean, every day there is a new platform, every day there is a new tech company that is changing the way we are uh, addressing uh, consumers. So it's a, it's, finally, we decided to see this change not as a threat, but as an opportunity to adapt ourselves. We didn't have the scale, but nevertheless, we were 16,000 people, so we were not a, a, a hot shop. It's a, it's, a, it's a big group with a strong presence in more than 100 countries. And we decided, okay, we have, the, we have the scale, the big scale, but we are not too big, so let's try to take advantage of not being too big. And we decided to use our agility, our nimbleity, to adapt more quickly than the other. And we have created a completely new approach of uh, doing advertising, of uh, collaboration process, and we have changed in six months dramatically the organization. And I think we have been helped by this uh, merger because we have uh, no, other choice than, uh, uh, no other choice than succeeding, otherwise we will, uh, we will have to, to close uh, our shop and uh, our people love, uh, love working for Havas. And uh, what's interesting is when you took the same situation uh, 18 months later, it was still me, uh, CEO of Havas, and I went to London to see the same uh, analyst, analyst, same uh, smart people, and they say, uh, well done, uh, it's very good, I always believed in Havas, uh, <laughs> you are more nimble, more agile, uh, your scale is perfect, uh, that's just because we have posted the stronger uh, uh, financial performance of the entire industry. So I think uh, it's very interesting your question about scale and about the merger because it has allowed us to, to raise ourselves the right question to adapt uh, uh, quicker than uh, if nothing would have happened. And now uh, we came out uh, stronger from this event than, uh, than we entered it. One of the things that you did that was interesting, I thought, was you creating a Havas village. Uh, I guess you started in the, in the Paris headquarters where you really sort of flattened the organization um, and uh, with an eye to you know, sort of really integrate your operations. I'd be really curious to know how that's gone and then how that is informing what your clients are doing. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, advertising is like uh, villages. You have a lot of different villages uh, competing with each other. They, they don't like each other. They, they have a lot of ego. And uh, with the digital, there is a lot of, not blurred line, but clear overlap between the different uh, groups of people. And we decided to, to gather everyone into the same uh, big village so we can create an ecosystem that will foster collaboration. And uh, I remember completely the first meetings we did with everybody together. Uh, I'm sure you all have seen Game of Thrones and I think it's gonna come at season five is on Thursday. And the first meeting was like a Game of Thrones meeting, you know. You had to, to, to leave your weapons at the, at the door, <laughs> the clock room. And uh, we started those meetings like that but uh, after a certain period of time, uh, we have managed to create uh, something unique, something new, uh, much more transversal, much more integrated, much more global. And I think it has been uh, uh, one of the key reasons that, has, that is explaining our uh, success today. With that said, how, how is that informing how, you're, how you've approached strategy? And how, how does the, the notion of strategy evolve in, in creating content? I know you, we have also have another clip from uh, Air France, correct? Yeah. Um, maybe you can just talk about that quickly, we'll, we'll air the clip and then we'll come back to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay so let's air the clip and we'll, yeah. uh, we'll talk about it. Madame, Monsieur, bonjour et bienvenue à bord. Welcome aboard, ladies and gentlemen. La représentation qui va suivre concerne votre sécurité à bord. Merci de nous accorder votre attention. For your safety and comfort, please pay attention to the following safety performance. Chaque fois que ce signal est allumé, vous devez attacher votre ceinture. Elle soulignera élégamment votre taille tout en garantissant votre sécurité. Nous vous recommandons de la maintenir attachée de façon visible lorsque vous êtes à votre siège. Pour détacher votre ceinture, soulevez la partie supérieure de la boucle. Whenever the seatbelt sign is on, your seatbelt must be securely fastened. It will elegantly highlight your waistline while ensuring your safety. We recommend that you keep your seatbelt fastened and visible at all times while seated. To release the seatbelt, just lift the buckle. 
Il est strictement interdit de fumer dans l'avion, y compris dans les toilettes. Vous verrez, sans tabac, c'est plus chic. This is a non-smoking flight and it is strictly prohibited to smoke in the toilets. A non-smoking flight is simply chic. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's taking something, a very simple concept, the airline instruction dance we all do when we travel. Um, but to talk about how uh, strategy informed that work. I think this piece of brand content is very interesting because uh, it clearly demonstrates a different approach we could have. I mean, I'm coming from the, the, the well, MIP TV used to be my former MIP. Now I'm in Can Lions, but uh, I, I know quite well the, the two industries. And I think uh, one of the difference of uh, approaching uh, brand content between uh, advertising agencies and production companies uh, come from the brand strategy. There is a job uh, we have in advertising agencies that doesn't exist in production company, which is, uh, which is the job of uh, uh, strategic planner, strategic planning. So these guys are people who are uh, working on the brand strategy, discussing with their CEO, with their CMO about their competitive landscape, where they want to go, what they want to achieve. And this is those people who are briefing our creative people. So they are a kind of translator between what the brand wants and uh, what kind of piece of content can be achieved. So we are clearly not starting from an audience standpoint, what people would like, but we are starting from what the brand would like. So the, the starting point is different when you are working from a, an agency standpoint or from a production company standpoint. What we have been created to try to conciliate those two worlds, the best of those two worlds, is uh, Havas Production Company, uh, where we gather together people from advertising and people from, uh, from the traditional content industry. This is not an advertising agency, agency. this is not a, a production company, this is clearly a mix. Uh, we call it a, a, an agency, uh, a production agency. Uh, and we are trying to develop this type of, uh, of brand content that you will see on your way back to, to UK or the US. But I think it's a, it's a great way to, for a brand to express itself differently than from a boring, classic uh, safety instruction standpoint. I know we touched on it before, but in the fact that you have mathematicians as part of your organization, how are they getting along with the creatives? And how do you referee that? Uh, it's very, uh, we used to have two types of people in advertising, the, the rational people, let's say the media guy, the, the, the people buying the media, serious people with a suit, with a tie. I'm not wearing my tie because uh, I've been told not to wear a tie in Vip TV. <laughs> and, uh, but I uh, will wear it for Cannes Lions. And uh, we had the emotional people with long hair, with a beard, the, the, the hipsters, uh, trying to, to coexist. And now we have these mathematicians people. So this is a uh, Let's say a, a, a third category. We have a lot of geek people uh, joining uh, forces with us. It's uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. It's uh, different people. They are uh, even in they are in the same open space or on the same desk. Uh, they are communicating through uh, emails. They don't talk. <laughs> it's just a new way of expressing itself, but it's working very well. And when you create this alchemy, this collaborative attitude, uh, you can have some very nice campaign coming out of this. Uh, brain, um, let's say, uh, dilution, brain exchange. So, no, no, it's, it's interesting to have this uh, third type of approach. But you know, we have uh, hired some people in, uh, who have been awarded by the Field Medal in mathematics. It's the equivalent of the Nobel Prize. Speaking of hires, what, what do you think the most important hire you'll make in 2015 will be? You know, if, uh, Sorry to state the obvious, but every hire is, uh, is important. In the advertising, uh, the only asset that we have is, uh, is talent. We don't have any recurrent TV series, TV format, so we, we are just selling uh, a brain for our, uh, from our people to, to, to advise uh, clients. I would say that, uh, maybe try to, to, to give you a, a certain answer. Uh, I was having a, a discussion with my 17 years old nephew and uh, he asked me, what, what do you think uh, I should go for, uh, for university? I said, okay, if you want to be sure to have a job very easily and get well paid, uh, become a data scientist or go and work in the mobile industry. I mean, it's, it's where there is uh, the more needs uh, for, uh, nice, for good people. 
Are you, uh, are you intrigued by any of the sort of bleeding edge uh, platforms out there now? I know that you know, Periscope and Meerkat have gotten a lot of buzz, but the paint isn't really even dry on those things. I mean, do you, how do you sort of balance being in, in touch with the bleeding edge but not getting so seduced by it you fall over it? I think it's very important for a, a group like, uh, like ours that we remain very forward thinking. We need to embrace innovation. We have opened a lab in Silicon Valley, in Los Angeles, in Boston with the MIT, in South Korea, in Tel Aviv. And I think it's very important to have people uh, whose job consists in uh, trying to uh, to discovering uh, new uh, tech platforms in order to be the first to to present them, uh, to introduce them to our clients. So I think it's important to have people in this type of uh, geography where we have, uh, where the innovation is coming from. Are there, are there any p particular markets you are, are looking to for queues? Uh, South American markets or Korea with mobile? Korea is an imp interesting market because this is from far the most advanced country in uh, broadband. They have uh, been the first to release a 5G. So they, it's not mobile first in Korea, it's mobile only. I'm not sure they have desktop anymore. <laughs> uh, in, um, I mean, in, Southern, in South America, we have some very interesting cases. I mean, the craft might be not as good as the craft in New York, but if you just think uh, from an idea standpoint, uh, some idea from the South Hemisphere can, can be quite interesting as well. Is there an industry buzzword that you're completely bored with or annoyed by? Many. I'm not sure we'll have enough time to. to <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, all the buzzwords. I mean, uh, data, uh, content, uh, digital, uh, 360. I mean, all those words that, in fact, mean so many things that it doesn't mean anything because we are talking about different stuff. You know, it's like uh, when I talk about data, it's like I will just give you uh, an analogy. If I show you my hand, say, you know, this is my hand. You know, I show you something else, but I say, this is my hand as well. This is the same with data, this is the same with content. We, you can talk about many different things, but with the same words. So uh, I think we need to precise a little bit what type of data, what type of content we want to talk of. Uh, how is your relationship with uh, Vivendi going to evolve in the near term? No, I, I'd like to, to, to say that uh, the two companies uh, have a standalone strategy which is very uh, successful in, in both cases. Uh, we, we are, of course, the advertising agency of Canal Plus, so it's a very close, uh, close link and uh, professional uh, from a business standpoint and from a personal standpoint. And with Universal, we have launched a, a very nice uh, approach about data because, as you know, the, the music industry is going through a problem of monetization. They have problem to sell physical uh, discs anymore and to get uh, the same amount of money that they used to, to, to have in the past. But in the meantime, uh, their artists are becoming uh, superstars in social media. So I'm, I'm sorry to, to state the obvious, but uh, Rihanna, uh, Ariana Grande, Jesse J, uh, Justin Bieber, uh, uh, Bono, they have millions and millions of followers. They, are, they have even uh, became, uh, become more powerful than media itself. So, if we manage to help them to, with our mathematician and with algorithm to, to collect properly the data, to uh, optimize it, I'm sure uh, it could be a new source of uh, optimization for, uh, for, of monetization for the, the music industry. So in a nutshell, standalone uh, strategy for both, but uh, we are trying to help as we are helping all our different clients. Uh, we're almost out of time, but uh, the last question, what's the most important thing you need to be doing now with Havas or at Havas? that's going to set you up to be competitive and relevant in the next five years? You know, honestly, I have no idea how the world in five years will look. What is sure is that it will continue to change because everything is there to make it change. You have an acceleration of the change, an acceleration of, the, of adoption of the new platforms by the consumers. So what's very important is that at the company, but that's the same thing for, for all of us and for all, all our clients all over the world, uh, whatever the industry they are working in, it's very important we constantly open our eyes, our ears, and we are ready to adapt 
and to shift paradigm. We have shifted one paradigm, once paradigm two years ago when we created the Havas villages, and we need to be ready to shift again of paradigm in order to adapt to meet our future clients' expectations. So never stop. All right, that's a great way to end. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking Yannick for his time today. Okay, thank you.